<laughs> oh, we're just talking with our guest here. We've got to move on to the earthquake in Nepal. The latest estimates are there that more than 6,000 people have died in that earthquake that struck just about a week ago. Many more thousands are struggling now to get critically needed assistance, but rescue and medical teams say they're dealing with chaos and confusion, that the country was simply unprepared for a disaster of this magnitude. So we are going to introduce our guest, and we're going to talk about this today. Um, I'm going to start down at the end with Jolly Amatya. Did I say that correctly? Yes. All right, yes. and she is um, born and raised in Nepal, and you're now on the U.S. National Committee for UN Women, the New York chapter. Thanks yes. so much for being here Thank today. Thank you so much, Ryan. Thank you. Gary Shea is Senior Director of Humanitarian Operations for Save the Children, and they've been assisting in disaster relief for nearly 100 years now. A long time, and we have 40 years in Nepal. Wow. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Casey Rondello is Academic Director of the Department of Emergency Management at Adelphi University. Thank you all for being here with us today. Um, this, we see this periodically, a disaster of tremendous magnitude strikes and then everyone seems like they never saw it coming. They're totally unprepared. And that's happened in our own country. What do you see going on here? Is there anything out of the ordinary? Is this a bigger disaster than anyone could have anticipated? I think everyone anticipated this disaster back in 2001. Nepal was identified as the city most likely to have an emergency. I think it's important to remember that much of Nepal, much of the people of Nepal live in isolated rural villages. So the challenge of reaching them is what people are facing now and the impact of this emergency that's affected between four and eight million people is beyond the capacity, just as Katrina was beyond our capacity here in the United States. And we have another guest via Skype, Suzanne Gilbert, who is uh, representing a group called the SEVA Foundation. And uh, Suzanne, did you have people on the ground there already when this occurred? Yes, definitely. SEVA has had an office in Nepal for nearly 40 years. Uh, and we work in 20 out of Nepal's 75 districts. So we did have people on the ground who could swing into action very immediately. What feedback are you getting from them now about what's happening at this moment? Well, at this point, it's very much as you would expect if you've tuned into the news for even five minutes in the last five days. And that is, uh, there's a tremendous need. Uh, there are uh, very good local responses. Uh, the national government coordination seems to be rather sluggish. Uh, there's tremendous uh, international outpouring of support. Uh, in Seba's situation, we're very uh, we're sad that some of the communities we work in customarily are very affected by the quake. But on the other hand, we're very uh, glad that we know who's there, we know who to contact, and we've been able to send local teams of uh, Nepali from eye hospitals in parts of Nepal that are immediately south of the very uh, earthquake affected areas. And SEVA typically helps restore vision or care for people who have had vision injuries, vision loss, but uh, they do assist in emergency situations too. Jolly, you also have friends, family, you're born and raised in Nepal. Have you been in communication as well? Yes, yes, I have been, uh, been in communication with my family. Thankfully, my parents, my immediate family are alive, but they're just alive. They're in constant fear. All the lives that are gone are gone, but the ones who are even, who are surviving, the ones who are the survivors, they're living in constant fear and constant mental trauma because we've had a multiple amount of aftershocks. Right now I just got information from one of my friends that uh, they had an aftershock of 5.0 magnitude um, just like a couple of hours ago. So this has been uh, absolutely terrifying. Um, there is no proper water supply, food, shelter and this is not just in Kathmandu Valley there there are a lot of village and remote areas that have not been touched yet there are a um, tremendous amount of aid and uh, facilities and uh, money coming on from all the countries and all the big organizations like Red Cross, Oxfam, everybody has been helping, the government has been helping too, but still, why are people not being reached out yet in those village and remote areas? If you really look at the history, there's a lot to learn from. Um, if I may refer to the Haiti earthquake in 2010, one of the biggest criticisms that the international community response had was the lack of involving the local people and the youth, especially in taking the 
uh, vital decisions. And this is very crucial and I think we really need to act on it and in try to involve more people who are local, who know the ground, who know the language, who are familiar with the customs right. and they, they would be uh, uh, exactly helpful um, uh, 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 in this kind of scenario. I know you've got some things in the works too and I want to talk about that a yes. little bit more but uh, Dr. Rondello, emergency management is your area of specialization. Can any community be prepared for something like this? Well, I mean, you're never, uh, you're never fully, completely repaired. Um, and, you know, that's in the developed world. And it, it's, it's hard for us to use the same measures uh, and uh, compare them to a situation in a country like Nepal. You know, this is a country uh, that is one of the most disaster-prone countries uh, in the world, uh, according to the UN. Uh, and, you know, the, the average per capita income is on the area of about $1,400 a year. These people have a difficult time getting by on a good day when things are So they're are not going to have all kinds of earthquake-proof structures mm -hmm. and Correct. the resources the to... Most, the most uh, dangerous types of buildings to be in in an earthquake are unreinforced masonry buildings. Unfortunately, virtually all the buildings in Nepal are constructed in that fashion. 75% of uh, the mortality due to earthquakes is a result of, uh, you know, building destruction uh, as a result from the ground shaking and they're in the position in Nepal where they're kind of set up for disaster you know they're they're in a, an area with great seismic activity the same geologic forces that created the Himalayas uh, unfortunately make uh, Nepal a country where there's uh, yeah. a great deal of tectonic activity but if the it, people are frustrated the people on the ground there in Nepal are very upset because the help can't get in they're afraid of disease and epidemic and they right. don't have anything in terms of food, water, clothing, shelter, it's it's a mess. But the rescuers are likewise frustrated. They can't get in, they can't bring it. So what's happening that we're not seeing that's going to eventually resolve this situation? Okay. I think a number of things have ha are happening. First of all, the number of people affected went beyond the capacity oh, like of anyone eight million, on the million, I think I saw estimates. Correct. Major NGOs are bringing in goods and supplies from India, from China, in mm -hmm. our case from Dubai, from the Philippines. Some are going into Kathmandu, but some will also go by land to other parts of Nepal where they can reach some of these isolated rural areas more quick, quicker. But it's also good to note that the Nepalese army, through the helicopters, it's going to require a tremendous, almost full-time, every day when it's not raining, helicopters going to these remote areas. Mm -hmm. I know in the case of Save the Children, we're getting out tents, tarps, and we're starting this, and we have more goods coming in. I think what's really important to remember is we have six weeks to go before the monsoon rains come in. Yeah. We don't have a lot of space for the people who are displaced in Kathmandu. We have to get temporary shelter, and temporary shelter may not be adequate to get through the long monsoon season. But help is starting to get in. It's going to require tremendous support of the entire international community, which meets regularly, but the needs are overwhelming. The pipeline will catch up and the needs of children and families. But some of these areas, that, as you were mentioning, mm -hmm. are in isolated, isolated rural areas. Right. We Save the Children worked in Gorka uh, for 15 years. Mm -hmm. And I personally have walked four or five days to some of these communities. In these communities, many of the people have died. We know that almost all of the schools have been destroyed. The health infrastructure is gone. And the people who man those and woman those posts have also had their lives affected. Well, I want to ask Suzanne, who's still with us via Skype. Suzanne, uh, are your people reporting to you the kind of things we're talking about here? And are they seeing any improvement in the situation? Uh, they're very much reporting, just as Gary said. Uh, it's a very universal situation. I think all the groups are coming in and focusing now on providing you know, food, shelter, uh, basic supplies, as we just said no family in these rural areas has an extra supply of food. There's no such thing as an earthquake kit or even awareness of the need for one. Uh, what they are reporting is what our teams are doing are heading into affected areas and then being deployed by the local coordinators to particular village district committees. Uh, Nepal is divided up into hundreds or thousands of village district committees and each village district committee at the local level is being assigned for support from uh, NGOs, governments, and any other groups coming forward. And we first go with, with convoys of trucks, then we ship to tractors, 
then we shift to facts. And it, as we're saying, it's going to take a lot of helicopter activity to reach those communities that are really beyond uh, the lands, far beyond the landslides. Great, thank you so much, Suzanne. And you know, it's not just people on the ground or supplies coming in, money is needed for all of this. It, people worry a lot of times, who do I give the money to and is it going to go where it's really supposed to be going? What do you answer for that? You have to be careful. Yes. Uh, because there are so many organizations that promote themselves as being involved in disaster relief. But, uh, you know, using several sources online, Charity Navigator, for instance, you're able to ascertain whether or not it is a charity that's actually doing the physical work and ensuring that the bulk of your contribution goes toward work and not toward you know, administrative structure, administrative costs. Because this is a situation that will be ongoing and evolving from the public health perspective for a long time. Now this is years in the rebuilding of this area. Right, you mentioned, you mentioned the uh, communicable disease. Uh, the mortality from you know, earthquake activity and the subsequent aftershocks, which we know are gonna continue for you know, up to a month, uh, you know, results in what you think of when you think of, you know, lacerations, broken bones, uh, head injury. But as time goes on and individuals uh, have poor nutrition, poor hydration, uh, a lack of adequate housing uh, for shelter, there will absolutely be a concern for emerging mm -hmm. communicable disease, uh, right. particularly those diseases that are, occur in uh, areas that have been devastated and there's a lack of clean water, a lack of proper sanitation. Uh, you know, infectious diarrheas and respiratory illnesses. You're talking about uh, creating a situation in which there will be many refugees living in close proximity, and that unfortunately is a recipe for disaster when it comes to communicable illness. Well, Jolly, uh, you had earlier mentioned young people mm -hmm. helping out. You yourself are a young person in my book. You've started a, uh, a crowdfunding campaign to raise money for this. Yes. As soon as we were aware of the fact that uh, a 7.9 of a powerful magnitude of earthquake has hit Nepal. We couldn't, I, my uh, uh, other colleagues, my team, we immediately knew that we knew what to expect in future. Even though we were in mental trauma, we didn't get to talk to her. I didn't get to talk to my mother for two straight days. And I saw all these pictures on uh, Facebook, all these pictures on BBC and CNN, all these beautiful heritages of Nepal monuments, uh, which is right two minutes away from my home where I was living and I didn't know what to expect I didn't even know if they were fine I didn't know if my house was collapsed but having said that being a youth and a representative living here and representing all my youth in, of Nepal I and my other friends we decided that we do have to do something that's in our capacity you know like we cannot wait for another moment so we uh, got together that very night we didn't sleep the whole night we were trying relentlessly to get in touch with our families but we couldn't and we started this crowdfunding initiative on Indiegogo.com, um, and uh, this is it, it is it, it, it is doing absolutely well. Uh, we've been raising funds, and our m motive is definitely, like I had mentioned earlier, to mobilize the young people, the m mobilize the local groups and NGOs who, who actually are already in the ground. There are so many people, you know, the survivors, the vic the survivors of the earthquake, the young people, you know, they're out there risking their lives. They're ready to go there on the site on the ground and help out everything but they're being frustrated they're being discouraged because they have no idea where the aid is going they know that you know the Red Cross is doing a lot of things and inevitably these uh, big organizations are playing a key role and the government will too but how, how about the sustainability well After people like to know they can help people yes. individuals well, like to know they can contribute positively to something and you in setting up this Indiegogo fund were able to get the organization collecting the money to yes. forego any kind of fees that they're going to charge yes right? exactly. all the money we reached out to the CEO and they've um, waived the platform fee which has made it very easy uh, easy and very convenient because the amount of trust the donors have put upon us like we want each and every dollar to be accounted for and uh, luckily um, I'm, I'm happy to uh, announce it here that our uh, fund uh, campaign has already been on the grounds. One of the, two of the major uh, hardly hit areas, Sindhu Palchok and uh, Baseri, like uh, there were already the rescue teams with, the, they're already uh, on the spot Great. with like hundreds of tents and food and water purifiers and stuff. So we're, so we're doing, happening. Yes, yes. And, and it, it, the, our main okay. motive is to, you know, um, really mobilize and give, empower those young people because we not only focus on the, uh, 
uh, immediate relief, but this uh, Nepal is going to need us Nepal for the longest of time. The future. We have less than yeah. a minute left, and on that point, I wanted exactly. to say, Suzanne, you via Skype too, is there anyone who sees this as possibly the beginning of something better for Nepal? Perhaps they're going to rebuild stronger? You know, a lot if of attention for Nepal, and it's a time when people can understand that Nepal can do a tremendous amount for herself. Uh, what is needed is financial support from outside and also technical support as and when that uh, the, the emergency phase has cleared. Yeah. And uh, we're very pleased that Save a Foundation and Save the Children were noted in a PRI uh, article as being among the seven high, most highly vetted U.S. charities working in the earthquake relief, and we're, we're very delighted That's to be great. on the show. That's great. Gentlemen, any hope you see that something good might come of this? I think there'll be better construction. It's not going to be easy, especially in or the cheap. remote areas, because a lot of the people have passed away, and ha where people settle, how they space out their houses. Inside <coughs> Kathmandu, everything is so narrowly built, exactly. so and people there's are not going a lot of space, rethink. but some things will improve, but it's going to take time. Dr. Rondell, do you see that? Uh, it will take time. You know, the last major quake in, in 1934 that killed, you know, uh, uh, 20,000 people. Uh, we will continue to see significant seismic activity in Nepal. That's not going to change. Mm -hmm. But what can change is the cooperation of the international community assisting Nepal in, in improving their disease uh, and uh, disaster efforts as time goes on. All right. That Ladies, gentlemen, thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. And when we come back, we're going to talk about whether a huge earthquake such as the one we just saw in Nepal could possibly trigger or quakes um, elsewhere in the world. We're going to have the latest research on that when we come back.